one of the terms I developed, but not the, I didn't develop the phenomena, the phenomena we all experience. I call pro being pride. And it's not, it's not really an emotion. It's more of an experience of aliveness in a very unique way. Um, it comes from the word origin of proud, which is a Latin term and it's spelled P-R-O-D-E-S-S-E, pro dessa. Pro means for and essa means to be, um, but I think of it as for being, so pro being, pride. Um, and for being means the unique way you come alive. So a, a kind of quintessential example of this is when a baby is born and the parents are excited to be with and discover this baby and they go, ah! and it's like they have this sense of that unique person is engendering and stimulating my unique person with them and with myself and is a kind of delight. And that delight is interrelational. I'm delighted to be me. I'm delighted that you're delighted to be you and, and we're delighted to delight in each other. And delight in my view is not just joy and happiness, which it can be, it's more aliveness. Um, so I'm not just looking for a person is um, feeling, experiencing the effects of trauma. I'm looking for their experience of their own aliveness. Um, and it can often co-occur with the traumatic experience in the moment or through the processing of the trauma, that's what they experience. So that person I was describing often will have an experience through the processing of the trauma <clears throat> where they come alive and they will feel literally an opening in their chest. They will feel like they're looking up rather than down or they experience themselves as though they're standing up rather than crouched down. Um, and they feel a sense of wholeness or oneness with themselves, with me and with the world. <clears throat> and that is what I would call pro being pride. Hello and welcome. Um, I'm here today with uh, Ken Benau, PhD, who is a clinical psychologist based in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area. Uh, my name is Vincent Ryan and I'm a psychotherapist working in Ireland. So this is a part of a series of interviews where we look at how experiential therapists work and how they bring in experiential frameworks and techniques with their clients. Um, so a little bit about uh, Ken. So Ken, as I was saying, clinical psychologist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. He um, specializes in uh, shame and pride-based um, issues with clients uh, that are, you know, struggling with, you know, relational trauma in their lives and, and how that plays out for them. Um, so Ken works with both individuals, families, and children, and uh, he actually has a book coming out, a new book coming out. He's published in many uh, journal articles, but he also has a new book coming out entitled Shame, Pride, and Relational Trauma, Concepts in Psychotherapy. So Ken, you're very welcome here today. Thank you for, uh, for having me. So maybe if we just to, to, to begin, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you work in an experiential way with your clients. Yeah, I was thinking about what is experiential psychotherapy. And one way to think about it is to think about the relationship between experience and reflection and meaning making. So Experiential psychotherapy for me is attending to in the moment experience, but experience here could mean sensing, perceiving, uh, feeling, embodying. So it's, it's noticing what's happening right now, particularly in what I would call a bottom-up way, sort of body to mind, even though these are not separate. Um, and from what people call the sub cortical to the cortical. And then the reflection is how do I make sense of that experience? What meaning do I give it? Sometimes it's in the narrative form. Um, so experiential psychotherapy begins with 
the emotions, the body, the in the moment noticing of what's happening with as little initial interpretation of what it's saying. Um, and then letting that be noticed um, and experienced in a way that can be transformational or in a way that can lead to discovery of some knowing that previously was not known, was more implicit. So could you kind of give us an example of like, you know, how, you know, that would, how that would look in therapy with a client? Um, you might be talking about something and then you, you, maybe you notice something that's coming up emotionally. Maybe they're getting teary or maybe their eyes are kind of turning down and they look like something's coming up that hasn't been named. Um, it could be fleeting, so they may not no notice it. Um, it could be some slight movement, um, change in color like in their face, uh, a tensing of the body. It can be something that in this moment seems to be communicating something that the person may or may not be aware of that, that doesn't necessarily go with the narrative or may in some ways um, highlight or uh, amplify the narrative or sort of express the narrative. So uh, the session might be going along and I just notice a little flicker in their eyes or I notice something in the mouth that may look like it's communicating something emotionally like disgust, for example, very subtle kinds of um, observations or occasionally the, parent, the patient describes something like, oh, I'm really tired, or I suddenly got tired, um, and, or they yawn, and I bring some attention to it. So I might say, did you notice, uh, or notice, and um, can we, and then if they, often they don't, or occasionally they do, and I, I might say, um, can we just stay with that, or can we make some room for that? Uh, just to notice. And I sometimes, depending on if it's someone I've worked with a while, they already know this, but um, uh, people are prone to wanting to explain something. I think sometimes explain it away. Oh, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Um, but they weren't actually yawning until that moment. So maybe they were tired, but why in that moment? So um, I, I encourage them to just notice and to not rush to interpretation because one, it can interrupt the actual feeling of it or the embodying of it or the noticing of it. And two, usually um, neither of us really know what it's saying or what it might be saying, because it could be more than one thing. And so I want to help them and me be open to discovering um, what's happening. Um, and so uh, that's, that's where we start. And I encourage us to stay with it. Sometimes, you know, people I've worked with for quite some time, they know that I'm going to bring their attention to something they're feeling in their bodies. So I might say something like, uh, take a moment and go inside and notice what you feel in your body. Notice any places of tension, any discomfort. Notice where there might be some energy. Notice where you feel numb or blank. Um, and just bring some attention to that. So that's a way to kind of get into the experience um, before they figure out what it means. Right. So that's the discovery then. There's, um, there's obviously, as you say, there's the direct experience in the body and the sensation. And then there's the, the, the meaning making, the reflection. Yeah, my, in my experience, the... Um, the what it means emerges. You don't, you know, sometimes people, you know, if, if someone's been in therapy a while or they have an idea that therapy is about, you know, well, how does this relate to your childhood? And they maybe have already explored things about their childhood. It says, oh, well, you know, that's because this happened with my mother or my father or my brother or sister. And it may be 100% true, um, but that doesn't necessarily help them um, move to something new, to discover something new. So I might intentionally say yes, 
but let's see what we can discover now, because even if you've worked on something many, many times, the same problem or the same um, issue, um, if you really pay attention, something new will arise in that moment that, that it actually is a discovery for the therapist and the patient. It's not like sometimes patients say, well, you knew what was, you know, like I knew it was going to, I have no idea what's going to come up. And if I think I know that's actually a problem because then I'm imposing something on the moment rather than being open to learning with the patient uh, what they're, what's going on for them and what, uh, how they might make sense of it and how that might be helpful in their lives. Right. So there's a real, would you say there's a kind of a not knowing stance coming into the connection with the client then? Yeah, and you know we're we're knowing creatures. We we want to know, and me included. So it's not like I'm immune from imposing knowings or meanings onto something, interpretations. I I will do it way more than I is helpful. Um, and if I'm lucky enough, I'll have the patient say I'll say something, and they'll say, "Yeah, no, <laughs> that that's not it." Oh, great. <laughs> then, then I wake up from my own, you know, impos imposing and, and then kind of return to being more uh, observational and curious rather than um, uh, knowing it ahead of time or thinking more accurately thinking I know it ahead of time. Yeah, and I think it's often a great sign when a client disagrees or says, no, that's not it because that's a sign of a healthy relationship. Uh, there's trust there uh, that, the, that the, the client feels like, yeah, you know, I can be real here with my therapist. And Absolutely. Uh, and there's, they're having something, you know, like if someone says, well, no, uh, or about, or the yes about something, uh, I say, how do you know? And when they, they come to know that what I'm asking is not a intellectually, how do you know? It's what is happening right now um, could be thoughts, could be feelings, could be sensations, but what is happening right now that tells you, no, that's not right. Or, oh yeah, that's it. And it's usually felt. Um, you know, Jen Lin talks about a felt sense. And he was talking about something that was broadly speaking about the body and emotion, but not like a specific emotion, more like a gestalt, an overall feeling that says, ah, that's it. And when you kind of get the, ah, uh, that's it, the, the body shifts. Usually there's a kind of easing, um, a relief and a relaxing. Sometimes there's a kind of opening, the breath becomes easier. There's a kind of settling, like, oh yeah, that feels right. Um, so that's very powerful because it gives you a, um, access to, to a subjective truth for that person. And that's what you're, you're really aiming for. What is their subjective truths? And I don't mean truths in an idea way. I mean, in a full bodied experience way. Yeah. And that kind of felt truth is, is different from what the person may have come in the door with or a kind of a, a concept. It, yeah. It, well, it's almost, almost always different, uh, especially because people come into therapy uh, suffering in some way. And part of their suffering has to do with beliefs about themselves and relationship. And since I'm particularly interested in shame, that has to do often with um, beliefs about yourself as inadequate or defective or damaged or lazy or uh, stuck and will never change or boring. And um, all these are, are impositions that have developed over time, uh, always in relationship to someone and then in relationship to themselves. So, um, and these sort of blanket statements like I am this, um, particularly around shame, it, it reflects a be implicit belief that I always have been, I am now, and I always will be. So inherently, if you believe there's something defective or wrong with you as a person, then that's it nothing's going to get better because no matter how much it looks like you're changing. Yeah, but really I am. And so it locks the person in, in a way that's very harmful and doesn't allow for, for um, transformation or change or movement. 
So I'm looking to notice those uh, implicit beliefs and then help the person come to experience something in the session, not just talk about something in the session, which is fine, but to experience something in the session that is a discovery for them, like that they had no idea um, they were feeling that or had no idea that that might be something that's true for them. And then they have an experience that says, oh, something new can happen here. And that of course gives them hope. Right, so, and, and as you're speaking there, Ken, I'm thinking about there's an experiential part to that in the person that you're helping them to, to focus in on when you ask them to, to slow down to what's happening right now. It's not about the, perhaps the belief that they, that they carry with them, but you know, what's happening right now. So there's, a, there's an experience, but also there's a very relational part as well, which is also a, a relational experience. I was wondering, is, is, is that something that, you know, we could think about here or talk about here, the, the experience in, in, in oneself in the moment and how that relates to the experience of the other, in this case, you, the therapist? Yeah, so when we talk about uh, bringing attention to what's uh, happening in the moment or what's alive in the moment, um, if, you, if you go with a, a, an implicit assumption or an explicit assumption in my case that everything is relational. So there's no such thing as me utterly separate from you or me utterly separate from other people or the world. So if you think relationally or sometimes people would call that systemically, then in every moment in time, the person is, whether they're conscious or not, and often they may not be at first, or you may not be at first, there's a relationship that they're having with themselves. So there's a relationship they're having with their thoughts, their feelings, their sensations. They may be ignoring it, but then that would be the relationship. Or they're <clears throat> having a relationship with what many people call a part of themselves. Okay, there's a part of me, and then there's another part of me who, and so there's a relationship that way, or there's a relationship with different parts. There's this young part of me, and then there's this teenage part of me, and they don't get along very well. Here's what happens. Happens. So that's what you would call, or I would call intra-relational, the relational within. But then there's the interrelational. So um, uh, you have this sense of me as judging you. So look at me, um, take your time and tell, tell me what you're experiencing now. In what ways do you experience me as judging you or not? Um, and it's not just that they're having a relationship with me, I'm having a relationship with them. So I may notice as they're talking, I'm getting excited, or I find myself more alert, or I find myself getting sleepy, or I find myself thinking about something that's not in the session and wondering, well, why is that? Am I, is there something about the session that that makes me think of? Or is there something that's happening in the session that's distracting me or uh, interfering with my being really present and engaged? in the moment. So, and these things are not separate. We say, well, there's the interrelational and the interrelational, but they're not separate. If, if in this moment I'm feeling excited because I feel like something's kind of happening with them and me with them, that feels like something new or interesting or um, exciting in the sense of alive, not necessarily in the sense of happy. And if I bring that to them, like, wow, when, when you said that, I got these chills in my arm, which usually is one expression for me of, of uh, coming alive. Now, they can do any number of things with that. That might engender their becoming uh, more aware of their own aliveness with me. Uh, but maybe they would have a different experience. Maybe they would experience it as, oh, I see the session's all about you now. We're no longer talking about me based on whatever they're relational history is. So either way, it's useful because now we're having something right here and right now. Um, and sometimes people may feel uncomfortable with that, but as the therapist and the patient are become comfortable with that, um, it gets everybody's attention, right? You're, you're not just talking about, you know, what happened today. It's like, oh, um, I, I just turned away or you noticed me turning away 
What was that like for you? And these things, they're not separate from what the person is trying to um, grapple with. You just don't always know how they're related, but if it's the person's experience with me, it's highly unlikely that it is only with me. And even if it's particular to me, that's something that one can learn from. And it also strengthens the bond. Uh, if we're being real and authentic, there's a kind of emotional intimacy, then all sorts of good things come from that, both in terms of how the person feels about themselves and what becomes possible for them to experience with another person and what makes it and what's possible for them to face certain difficult topics if they have a sense of, I'm right here with them. Um, we're doing this together. And sometimes I might make that explicit, but often it's implicit where they know I'm right there. Um, and, you know, we can always face things better if we have a sense that we're not alone with it. Trauma by definition is being overwhelmed and alone with it. It's not just a bad thing happened. Um, so if you think about it, if that's trauma, then healing is they're having an experience however powerful and intense, but they're not alone with it. So together we're trying to understand and together we're regulating it emotionally or physiologically so the person's not overwhelmed. And together we're trying to make sense of it. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, I'm thinking of Diana Fosha, her comments. Yes. Yeah, like, you know, under right. the illness. And... Exactly, that's, that's one of the tributaries of my training is a AEDP. Okay, would you like to say a bit more about your experience of AEDP and your training in that and how that's informed your work? Well, I've been around a long time. I, I've been working, doing something in relation to um, therapy or mental health since, um, well, since I was even in college, way before I became trained as a psychotherapist. I worked with children on the autistic spectrum. I worked with children later in, in a residential program uh, that had, I call them my quirky kids. So they have all sorts of um, developmental learning, emotional, um, neuroatypical. Um, I think we're all, by the way, neuroatypical, but that's a separate matter. But uh, in that we're all unique. But so, um, so one of the ways I've and that's way back. And then since then, I've had training in psychodynamic approaches, somatic approaches, affect and emotion focused. The, the, my experience in graduate school was very congruent with AEDP. I was lucky to be in a program that was, that was experientially focused. And it was focused on psychotherapy, um, not some of the more traditional, I mean, it had the more traditional trainings for clinical psychology, but it was really emphasizing psychotherapy. And the people who were training us were largely what would be called experiential or gestalt therapists with some psychodynamic as well, and, and a good bit of somatic, somatic work. So that initial training that was experiential was part of my earliest training. And then when I was introduced to ADP, it, it it brought in some other things that I had been less aware of, certain attachment focused approaches, um, a little more explicit understanding of what I was doing. Um, when I was doing experiential psychotherapy, I knew I wanted to do that and I knew it felt something, but I didn't always know exactly what I was doing or why. Um, so ADP gave me a way also to, to think about the work. Um, and ADP is very much focused on the moment and the emotions that are coming up or the sensations and how that uh, uh, affects the person's or shows, expresses the person's relationship with themselves and particularly with the therapist. Um, and it's a very moment to moment uh, way of working. So there's a lot of aspects of that that are inherent in my way of working, even though I don't I wouldn't say I'm an AEDP therapist, but I, I wouldn't say I'm an anything therapist. I, I hope I'm a therapist that brings something particular of myself and my experience to that person, person who is their own particularity in, in the moment. Um, and so I was once at a training with Salvador Mnuchin, who's a famous 
uh, family therapist development developer of structural family therapy. And I, I think I may have, I don't know if he said this in the presentation or maybe I went up to him. I think he may have said it. And he's, he, I said basically to him, like, how do you do it? If you watch him, he was very dramatic and in the moment. And you're like, you watch him, it's like, why, how did you do that? And especially when you're a young therapist as I was then, it was like, everything is like, how did you do that? And he, and he said, it's trained spontaneity. And so the train part is you gather as many life experiences as you can, not just um, ones from therapy. I was trained in uh, my undergraduate degrees in English and American literature. So you get things from everywhere, from life. Um, and you pay attention to that experience. And the spontaneity is you, 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 you kind of throw it away and don't throw it away at the same time. In other words, you're not thinking, hopefully, technique. You're, you're, you're improvising, but the improvisation is like uh, if, if you were a jazz musician, um, you have a lot of training that allows you to improvise. You have to first learn how to do the song, the quote, right way before you do it the, oh, let's try this way. So um, at, at, at my best, um, what I'm bringing to it is some trained spontaneity. And because I've been around a long time, I've been, you know, trained in experiential process, process, um, approaches and psychodynamic and more attachment focused or emotion focused or somatic um, or even behavioral. I used to work with kids who had significant emotional behavior problems, many of whom couldn't talk or didn't have many words. So you have to pay attention to what's actually happening, not just what they're saying. Yeah, um, your, your training reminds me of my own and my training was very gestalt and experiential based and our groups were like that. So, and um, I remember one of our lecturers saying that about kind of like letting yourself forget the theory while also it's rattling around in there somewhere from just, yeah. uh, just doing. Yeah, I mean, once it becomes yours, then, um, then it's yours, it's like, um, once you know how to ride a bike, you're not thinking, okay, now the left foot, now the right foot, don't forget to turn this way, that way. There's the brakes too, remember those. Yeah. You're riding a bike. Um, so there's training, if you will, and then there's spontaneity. So if suddenly uh, the car swerves this way, you're not thinking, oh, this would be a good time to turn that way. You're doing it. And with patience, it means that any time in the moment something happens that you notice, it's available to you. And often when I'm working, because I, I can think about concepts, they're, they're available to me. Other, some people work very, um, without holding a lot of concepts in their mind. I have them available to me or approaches, but I don't plan it. It's more like in this moment, oh, this might be something I would try, or what do you think about it, thinking about it this way? So that's, that fits with trained spontaneity. Yeah, and, and it make, makes me think of procedural memory yeah. Often where relational trauma is operating uh, rather than Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And that as it's... well. Sorry, I didn't hear the last thing you said. Sorry. Yeah, would you would you find that as well in terms of working with relational trauma? That of, although there are these beliefs that can be very limiting, it's actually in a moment-to-moment -moment procedural kind of habits and stuckness that you're kind of really trying to focus on. Yeah, so I mean, there's many books, you know, uh, about the body keeps the score, Van der Kolk, or other people that write about the body or body memories. Um, much experience is registered in the body and remembered, not in the sense of, oh, I remember when, but when I'm talking about X, I notice my chest and throat tightening. Um, and the person may not have any idea why, and they, may, they would likely have no memory of why, uh, partly because things, you know, especially in trauma, things that are overwhelming, you don't have a coherent narrative about it. You don't have a story that makes sense yet. So um, you may have registered, you, you may only notice uh, there's something going on because suddenly you have this experience emotionally or in your body or a movement that you didn't expect, or sometimes it comes out in a dream or whatever. So 
um, it's what you have to work with. And also um, much experience in trauma, no one ever talked about. So if you, if you didn't have your, your subjective reality validated, yep, yeah, that did happen. Um, yeah, you, that was upsetting. Yeah, that was frightening. Then it's not real. The person hasn't um, encoded it, if you will. They haven't sort of given it a, me a meaning. Um, and they may absolutely question their experience. Like, oh, yeah, I always tighten in my throat. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and also, a lot of trauma is before a person has words or many words. So it, again, it's not encoded in language. Uh, it has to be given language, but given language that comes again from the bottom up, from something that's felt before it's quote, known or given meaning. So I would say most of the work in relational trauma begins with that. Uh, otherwise, you're ending up getting a theory of what's going on, but it's not going to shift the person's experience, much less their understanding. Yeah, and that sort of brings me on to another question. Is there like a client that you can think of from, you know, from, from the past, you know, obviously bearing in mind client confidentiality and maybe disguising details, but is there some session that maybe pops into your awareness, into your experience that kind of illustrates some of what we're talking about? Um, uh, there's a client I write about in several articles um, who experienced relational trauma of different kinds um, that inc included things that would be experienced as emotionally abusive, um, some physical and some uh, one experience of a sexual um, molestation. And um, they're a person who's quite adept at observing their, um, their in-the-moment experience, their feelings, uh, imagery, uh, physical sensations uh, very, of a very subtle kind, um, uh, and images that go with those physical sensations. And so they may be talking about something where they're feeling stuck, one of the articles uh, has to do with feeling immobilized, not being able to move. And that was, that was coming up in relationship to a molestation event. Um, but it could be coming up in relation to something they're feeling stuck with in their lives. And they don't, they don't know what it means. They don't know what to do with it. But they're very good with, you know, lots of experience working together with tracking their sensations. Um, so they may go inside and they may notice what's happening physically, or they may notice something that's coming up um, imagistically and some kind of imagery. And we're just following it. And because this particular person, but many people, are, they're quite capable of giving words to experience. So they're both, uh, they, pra they practice meditation and we've worked this way together. So they're good at observing without rushing to a meaning or interpretation or even a judgment about it. So they might be observing something in relation to this theme of, let's say, not being able to move, um, which was a theme of one of, well, actually two of my articles. And we just stay with it. And we discover some of what comes from it. Sometimes it'll something, there will be an actual memory that comes to them about not being able to move, or there might be something, um, uh, that reminds them of something that played out in their lives related to that or some place where they felt stuck. Um, or they might get in touch with, uh, the, 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 you know, sometimes the way I work is with parts. And, you know, sometimes the way a person identifies parts is through an age. Oh, that's the four-year-old me or the 12-year-old me. So they might then get in touch with there's the four-year-old me that's experiencing this and the 12-year-old me experiencing that. And they don't necessarily say those words, but they might. And so now there's all sorts of things that are happening uh, that can give us a window into where they're stuck. But also in this way of working, what I'm particularly paying attention to is where they're alive. Um, one of the terms I developed but not the, I didn't develop the phenomena, the phenomena we all experience. I call pro being pride. And it's not, it's not really an emotion. 
it's more of an experience of aliveness in a very unique way. Um, it comes from the word origin of proud, which is a Latin term and it's spelled P-R-O-D-E-S-S-E, prodessa. Pro means for and essa means to be, um, but I think of it as for being, so pro being, pride. Um, and for being means the unique way you come alive. So a, a kind of quintessential example of this is when a baby is born and the parents are excited to be with and discover this baby and they go, ah! and it's like they have this sense of that unique person is engendering and stimulating my unique person with them and with myself and is a kind of delight. And that delight is interrelational. I'm delighted to be me. I'm delighted that you're delighted to be you and, and we're delighted to delight in each other. And delight in my view is not just joy and happiness, which it can be, it's more aliveness. Um, so I'm not just looking for a person is um, feeling, experiencing the effects of trauma. I'm looking for their experience of their own aliveness. Um, and it can often co-occur with the traumatic experience in the moment or through the processing of the trauma, that's what they experience. So that person I was describing often will have an experience through the processing of the trauma <clears throat> where they come alive and they will feel literally an opening in their chest. They will feel like they're looking up rather than down or they experience themselves as though they're standing up rather than crouched down. Um, and they feel a sense of wholeness or oneness with themselves, with me and with the world. <clears throat> and that is what I would call pro-being pride. But it's not like I planned it. it, it, it emerges. I think when a person can process something very painful where they've been traumatized, this way of being alive happens. You don't impose it, it because the potential for being alive is there from the moment of conception. Um, and trauma doesn't erase one's aliveness. It, it occludes it. It makes it harder for the person to be aware of it or access it. So that's an example of how you're, you're working in the moment, you're working with trauma, traumatic experience, often embodied, um, but you're also paying attention to the embodiment of their own unique way of being alive. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And it's interesting, the experience I had when you began talking about this, um, this kind of pro-being was of uh -huh. a baby actually, like a- yes. And actually kind of that kind of inherent kind of here I am kind of, you yeah. know, you know they, they look back, isn't this amazing? Aren't I amazing? Right. The, right. the parents or whoever's around responding with yes. just, you know, like, you know, admiring or participating yeah. in this kind of moment of being. Yeah. That's what yeah. kind of, and it, it just sounds. Did you have, did you have that? Uh, image before I said the thing about the parent or did yeah. you have it after I said it? No, just at the very start, Ken, just when yes. you said, yeah. Mm -hmm. So th this is a, this thing that just happened with you and me it is where therapy also comes alive. There's many times a patient's talking and I start getting a feeling or an image. And then uh, 30 seconds later, they describe that feeling or image. So we're now in sync. Yeah, right. I didn't say anything. The, the quintessential experience of pro being pride, the one that most people can get if they were happy to be with their baby, they're not always, um, is what you just talked about. And but you didn't know I was going to say that. Mm. Uh, so now we're in sync. We're, we're connecting. And that happens with patients all the time where they say something. And I say, I was just about to say that. Or I say this image that came to my mind and they say, that is amazing. I was having the same image. That doesn't always happen, but when it does, you really know like you're synced up and um, the therapy is really coming alive at that point. And you're really kind of on a shared mission at that point. I mean, in a way that you may not have even fully known until that moment. And you're like, okay, we're, we're in sync. Let's, you know, we're good now. Let's just see where it takes us. Yeah, and I can really, and that's lovely, and I feel that, and I, I, I just notice how you know you're smiling, and you're, you're, you know, it's, it's enjoyable experience for, for both of us, and I, yes. I see that in your face, and is that a real characteristic? Do you find of working this way with clients that actually it becomes very 
much like, oh, there's joy that can be shared here in this, through this process. Uh, absolutely. Even as you say that, I get a kind of tingling sensation, the tingling sensation. Um, uh, body therapists sometimes call it streaming, where there's this kind of energy that's tingling or moving uh, throughout your body. Um, and it's an expression of one's coming alive or excited or interested. Um, and um, I, I'm pretty expressive. Um, if I'm not expressive, then I, there's something going on that's inhibiting me, that's not allowing my fuller self to come forward. So I will smile, I will laugh, I will play. Um, it doesn't mean I'm always, uh, you know, um, playing, but I think therapy at its best, I would call serious play. Mm -hmm. It's serious because it matters. We're talking about something that is about that person's life that's troubling them or where they're suffering and have been for some time. So that's serious. That's not something you take lightly. But if there's a, 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 a way of being with the person that, you know, I smile, I'm not like saying, oh, this would be a good time to smile. No, something's kind of light, lighting up in me uh, about in relation to what you're saying or in relation to what I'm experiencing or both. Um, and I want to share that. I want to share it because it's me. I want to share it because there's something that's happening now that needs us to kind of be with and play with. I want to share it because um, if I'm coming forward as myself, it's an implicit invitation for that person as well. Um, it also will happen for me, the person might be describing something that is incredibly painful uh, and I'm with them, but then I get a image of them as, I don't know, it could be a child and I can just feel something about them that is uniquely them and is not about their suffering. And so in this moment, they're describing something quite painful. I'm both with that and I find myself kind of smiling. And sometimes I'll even share that. I say, you know, what you're describing is incredibly painful, but I found myself smiling. And it's not about um, I'm being disrespectful. It's more like in this moment, that you're describing this, I can really feel something about you that is so you. And if I can bring that to their attention or our shared attention at the same time, number one, the, the door of experience, you know, the windows of experience, um, Aldous Huxley or whatever came up with that name of the book, um, uh, doors to, what's that doors to experience? Anyway, that the, um, now it's widened. And if you think about it from the perspective of memory reconsolidation, which is an old implicit knowing bumping into a new implicit or even now explicit knowing, and they're, they're both true, right? The person's suffering and the per person is incredibly alive and they're both true and they're both true in the moment and they can't both be true. I can't be utterly humiliated and feel worthless at the same time I feel like, isn't it amazing to be me? Okay, but that happens. And if you can bring the person's attention to both, something shifts and you can literally pay attention to it uh, through imagery, like just bring them both together or through something in the body. Where in your body do you hold the shame? Where in body do you hold that sense of your own joy? Notice what happens as you shift your attention from one to the other. And so this is just different ways of paying attention to experience that is both congruent, congruent with, it, with what they're suffering and 100% incompatible. You can't feel fully alive and feel like there's something horribly wrong with you at the same time. And yet both can co-occur and bringing attention to it brings up, brings to attention something much more whole. Yeah, yeah, and I can really see that, that um, it's a, you know, it's a corrective emotion experience or juxtaposing experience that is, is your, your you know, you're bringing that. So the client is bringing their, their experience, but you're, you're, you're bringing them into awareness of a, of a, of a bigger reality, perhaps. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if you think about it, that's the job of a therapist. The job of a therapist is to disrupt, mm -hmm. meaning to, to, to interrupt and disrupt uh, familiar ways of knowing and feeling and relating, uh, because those quote-unquote familiar ways is where they're stuck. 
they're locked into a way that limits the sense of themselves or what's possible uh, in relation to other people. So anything that disrupts that in a way that's um, tolerable, that doesn't overwhelm the person um, is good. Even if you don't know where the disruption is gonna take you. Yeah, what did Carl, or what did uh, Fritz Perls call it? The creative emergency, I think, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that one, but that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Something like that. Right. Just, just for myself and for the viewers, Maybe you could kind of help us like understand when a new client comes to see you, Ken, yeah. and they, they, they come to your practice or you work with them online. How do you kind of approach a new client in terms of this way of working? How, how, like, how does that look, do you think? There's a line that Diana Fosher from ADP uses, uh, not a line, uh, a word, but it's not just a word, it's a way of being. And the word is welcome. So that's quite, you know, people often don't feel very welcome. They don't feel welcome to their own experience or to the relationship. So it doesn't mean just because you say welcome, they're feeling welcome, but it often gets their attention. But in, in terms of, and also helps me, right? Because if I say welcome to someone, if I'm really feeling it, then now I'm welcoming both of us to something. So it's immediately like, oh, uh, but, but you, you know, what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability is to listen. And if I'm like you talked about earlier, if at my best I'm approaching uh, our experience not knowing, then, then I can be curious. That means about anything. Um, and so I might just notice something there they said and say, oh, I noticed you said this or, um, you know, I don't try to overwhelm them with noticing things that they might not be comfortable having noticed yet, like they turn their head a certain way. But I might, depending on how, how my sense of what uh, we can do together, or what's possible. So I'm trying to stay very, very close, not just to what they say, but what they're feeling, uh, what they might be experiencing in their bodies. Although for some people that takes time to learn how to notice they have a body and what's going on. So it's a kind of moment to moment noticing. Um, and then not just noticing, but when you notice it and if you share it, then noticing what they do with that. And then together we notice what they did with that. Um, and so I'm very much trying to approach it with not knowing, with curiosity and with discovery and not rush to figure out how it relates to their problem or what to do about it. And it might, in which case I might say, oh, so da da da, that just happened, or that you just described, does that relate to what you said you were wanting help with? So you try to then weave it in. Um, but it's in the spirit of um, discovering something new together. I've had um, patients, this is not uncommon, it doesn't happen all the time, where the person has had therapy before and they got whatever they got from it. <clears throat> And then they come and they have an experience in the session, first session, like I've never had that happen. And I think it's primarily because I'm working experientially. It's not like, um, well, let me say it this way. I think it's because I'm working experientially and the persons they were working with prior may not have been. And so they already know a lot about themselves and have a lot of the theories, if you will, about who they are, why they became the way they are. But they might not have had something in the moment happen, which is like, whoa, I've never felt that. And when a person has that new experience, they're, all, they're always excited about it. And it also gets their attention. And they don't know what it means. And yet something tells them this is important. <clears throat> and that gives them a sense that something new can happen in the therapy even they have no idea what the new will be. And that gives them hope. And that makes it possible for them to come back with the felt sense of, oh, uh, he or we together can do something new. Um, and that's, that's a good example of how working experientially can shift something um, from the first session. In fact, you, you hope something happens in the first session. You can't plan it, but you hope it will.
Yeah, I'm really hearing about that that hope piece, the the, the installation of hope. I think, uh, um, was it Yalom talks about that in one of his books, or perhaps all of his books. Um, <laughs> sure, <right. laughs> very likely. Um, do you find with different patients, different clients, that this way of working kind of goes goes easier, or are there certain clients because you know maybe they find it hard to you know, tune into their bodies or their sensations, or they, they expect something or different, or they've heard about other types of therapy. You know, how does that play out for you when you, when you meet a client? Or do you notice that with some clients, it kind of the experiential way of working is, uh, is, is kind of a more of an easy match than others? Yeah, definitely. Like the person I was describing before, but many people, um, they surprise themselves uh, in terms of how I've had people say, Oh, I'm not good with emotions or I don't know what I'm feeling. And then we start noticing what's actually happening in their body. And they know exactly what they, they don't, they don't always know at first what it means, but they can feel. And they didn't know they could feel because, you know, maybe their life experience, maybe growing up, no one noticed, Oh, you look tired or, oh, you look very sad. This is noticing something in the body. This, you know, parents who are, quote, good enough, like Winnicott spoke about, they notice these things. And then the child comes like, oh, oh, that's tired. And when I'm tired, I can take a nap, right? It's like, this is such a simple thing, but people don't necessarily have this experience, especially if they grow up in a family where people don't notice feelings and people don't take interest in feelings and people don't know what to do with feelings. And, um, so sometimes people who are very, uh, you know, literally come in and say that, uh, emotions is not something that I'm, you know, I'm not good with, um, they discover they actually are, um, or people don't think they're good with noticing their body, but you teach them a little bit just to bring attention to it and like, and they're quite good at it and they're quite good at describing it. And then there's a process we develop together that kind of trust will discover something. But, but, there, so, but there are people who, you know, who I may not work this way with. Um, it's not like I don't work way at all, but I may not spend much time noticing what's happening in their bodies. I, I try to track what's happening emotionally and give that some words, but they may be a person who actually needs to talk about things. And if I were to, and sometimes I have, if I were to introduce a way that's more uh, focused on imagery or focused on bodily sensations, it won't fly or it will be off-putting. Well, if it's off-putting, then I'm not paying attention to their experience. I have to find a way to adjust. I have to be a fit, but it's not there alone to create the fit. It's actually much more, it's my job to be a fit. I have to shift how I work. And so with those people, the experience is more together trying to understand. And you might say, well, that's talking and narratives. And I say, yes, it is. But if you're with someone and they feel your response shows that you accept them and you're interested in them and you think that they have something that matters and therefore they matter and you're talking, but they're having this experience and they grew up in a family where no one paid attention or no one showed interest, or their view, the parents' view of them was as if there was something wrong with them. And I'm sitting here and I'm taking interest in what they're saying. They're having a new experience. I may not say, are you noticing that you're having an experience with me that you describe never having with your parent? I may, may or may not say that, but there's something experiential happening that's new and alive for them, even if we're quote unquote, not paying attention or not explicitly talking about emotions or physical experience or imagery um, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's a really key point that we can make these kind of like contrasts between experiential therapy versus talking. And actually that experience of, you know, permission to talk about oneself, maybe, you know, maybe beliefs or ideas and being experienced by the therapist or the other person as welcoming that, that itself is a very 
very de definitive experience that, as you say, it might be a needed experience or one that was really missed out on developmentally. And I just wonder, is there any client from your, your past that kind of comes to mind where maybe it was a lot around that? Uh, yeah. Um, it, it fits with what I was just describing. Um, I can think of several people like this. Um, these are people who grew up in environments where there was nothing that you would call abuse. There was no physical abuse or no sexual abuse. There was no emotional abuse. But part of the, the big, biggest problem is there was no. There was no attention. There was no interest. There was no delight. You know, the, the child walks into the room and the, do, the child does nothing. The child walks into the room and says, like, ah, Joey. Or they just look up and they smile. Now, Joey knows that Joey matters and uniquely Joey, because with Mary to be, oh, hi, Mary. And that's the unique way of being with Mary. And Mary knows that's their unique way of being with her. So well, I'm talking about people who didn't have that. I'm talking about people who uh, either they got <clears throat> a, a projection, like there's something wrong with them, or they, 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 they were not seen. They were not felt, they were not known. And that means they didn't matter. And that is the deepest root of shame. It's not just someone overtly shaming you, you little so-and-so. It's that you walked home from school <clears throat> and your parents on the phone, <clears throat> they don't even notice you walked home from school. They wouldn't notice if you're sad, you're bored. They wouldn't notice if the test went well, if the, the worry you had about your friend uh, got better or worse, they wouldn't know. So if I'm in the room with someone, and you could say this is true for everyone, we go through life and often people don't pay any attention to us, or we to them, or they think they know us. So they say, oh, you should do this. And I'm like, yeah, I haven't really told you what I'm feeling. So therapy is like a huge thing that come in and you're like, listen, and you care. But if in addition, you have a history of more quote unquote neglect, not in the sense of, you know, you didn't get to eat in the sense of you didn't matter, then anything that communicates implicitly and genuinely, you matter. Not just I'm a therapist and you pay me, no, you matter. And sometimes clients will say, oh, you just, uh, you're just doing that or saying that because you're my therapist. And a lot of times I'll say something like, you don't, uh, oh no, because I pay you, that's the one, because I pay you. And I say, you pay me for my time and expertise, but you don't pay for my caring about you. And if, if they've experienced me caring about them, because that's not just a line, if they've experienced that, then they know that's true. They absolutely know it. And that experience of being cared for is huge, particularly for people who nobody noticed and no one cared about. And that's experienced as something new, even if you're quote, only, only talking. Yeah, yeah, so there, there, there's that journey then from, from shame and not being known and not knowing oneself because often I suppose we need people to help us <clears throat> to discover ourselves and um, yeah. And then um, I'm thinking about that kind of that transition or that movement between perhaps shame and, and pride and the pro being experience you're talking about there. And would that be really central to so many of your clients or is that something that you see emerging with a client or how does that maybe fit into maybe a client coming to you with a specific goal? Well, you know, with, with regard to shame, it's something that I've been living with either myself or with the people I work with uh, without necessarily initially even knowing that was shame. Uh, shame doesn't, people 
never or almost never come into therapy and say, I'm feeling ashamed and I want to work on that. Um, they come in with feeling anxious. Uh, maybe they have performance anxiety. Well, often they're anticipating not being well received, being ignored or being judged. That's an implicit shame or anticipatory anxiety about something that would shame them. Or uh, they feel depressed and they may talk about, you know, um, I feel like it just doesn't matter. Well, that could be it, like it doesn't matter. It could be, I don't matter. Now we're sort of in the realm of shame again, or, or they're, they're, they find themselves really angry. Uh, they don't like being angry and they're, they're reacting with anger. And you then start exploring, well, what was going on when they started to find themselves angry. And it's one of those things that actually is implicitly shaming. They were ignored. Um, they were criticized. They were judged even mildly, but in a way they reacted with anger as a kind of uh, self-protective response to feeling shame. They may not, they may know they're angry. They may have no idea that underneath it, it's shame. So, I mean, in my experience, and partly it's a huge bias of mine, I would say um, all so-called psychopathology is fear or shamed based or both. And if you just hold those two ideas, something uh, frightening that was overwhelming, something that um, made the world not feel safe and made you not feel safe within or relationship, just fear and shame being embedded in both of those, um, you'll discover how many ways of adapting emerge out of that. And those ways of adapting, we end up calling psychopathology, but they're really adaptations um, that make perfect sense in some relational context. They just are problematic now. Yeah, so that, that they're really powerful organizing ideas then and the, 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 the effects of fear and shame in, and how it shows up for different people, perhaps in different ways. Right, and then it, if you're comfortable with, well, first of all, if you're able to notice when shame is lurking, because shame is, is often, literally means to cover, so shame is often not available to anyone's consciousness. I've worked with people, and I'm always thinking in terms of shame, I work with people, and then we suddenly bump into them, like, duh, how come I didn't notice that? But that shows you how well hidden it was, even from me, not just from the person. But if you are able to bring attention to a person's experience of feeling inadequate or defective, or they're not even there, um, first of all, you're comfortable looking at where they feel their most pain or suffering. People, again, don't come forward with this, even if they have some awareness of feeling quote, bad about themselves. If you bring attention to that, number one, they discover things about themselves they didn't know. Not just about where they're hurting and suffering, but where their aliveness was neglected or not, or not attended to. And if you're now paying attention to them, with them, to where they're feeling alive, they're going to experience pleasure. And they're going to experience pleasure in them, or they may. And they're going to potentially feel pleasure in being themselves. So there's the pride of taking pleasure in what I accomplished. That's what many people think of as adaptive pride. You know, there's maladaptive where I'm kind of arrogant and dismissive. Adaptive pride is I did it, look, I did it. But the kind of pride that in addition I'm talking about that I call pro being is I am. Not just I did, I am. And it isn't amazing that I am me, meaning I have a unique way of being in the world and therefore, I have a unique way of relating to myself and others. Yeah, lovely. Um, I'm actually thinking, just as you're saying that, Ken, of um, oh, someone like Les Green Greenberg uh -huh. from the Emotion Focused Therapy um, tradition. And he talks about having markers, kind mm -hmm. of things that the therapist can look out for, you know, though, before we become spontaneously kind of expert, right. Right. Kind of look the, out the, for the training part. Yeah, yeah, exactly the bit that we have to kind of do over and over to get really kind of natural with, but are there markers in a person, say face or body or how you're experiencing them that you're like, okay, you know, this is something to do with shame that, you know, we could maybe like focus in on a bit. 
Oh, with regard to shame, um, uh, well, a marker is what they don't talk about. Um, another marker is turning away, looking down. Uh, there's some people who have difficulty maintaining eye contact. I work a lot with people on the uh, autism spectrum. So some people on the spectrum, they have difficulty making eye contact, but not necessarily because they may or may not feel shame. Um, it's more that the, the face uh, is not providing meaningful information. And also sometimes the stimulation is overwhelming. But I'm talking about people who are not on the autism spectrum, who um, they won't look at you. And therefore they, 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 they're not thinking they're not looking at you, they're just being themselves. Um, or they won't, and if you don't look at someone, then you're not having them look at you. Um, well, why wouldn't you look at someone? Well, you could be frightened. Maybe people in your life were threatening. Um, but also you can feel shame. Like if I look at them, they'll, they won't, there's nothing there. Like I'm not even there when, when I, when they, you know, look at someone or they anticipate judgment. I, I will be with people and they're experiencing something and, um, and they know that I'm judging them. And they have difficulty looking at me to find out whether that's true or not. And if they can tolerate looking at me in this moment, they often have the, sometimes they'll think, you are thinking these things about me. And I have to check with myself, because if I am, I have to be real with them. But often they can just look and they say, oh, not, not in words, oh, like just the experience, oh, he's not thinking of me as da da da. I can tell because of his eyes or the little smile on his face. And I can tell that's real. It's not like he's acting a certain way. So eye contact, a turning away of the body, turning down in a way, uh, energy getting depleted, a uh, constriction and tightening, um, uh, hiding, and that doesn't have to go to the extreme. It could feel they feel their shoulders coming in and their chest becoming concave. And if they, if, you were, if they were to follow that motion, you know, if this comes from sensory motor psychotherapy, excuse me, and other somatic approaches, they might, if they followed where their body wanted to go, they might go like this, which is a classic shame posture and fear as well. So um, those, are some, those are some markers. Of course, there's the more classic markers of the person gets a flushed face, um, but it's often these subtle things. Sometimes it'll be an interruption, like they're going along and then they stop. But it's not a stop like they're going inside and they're deepening, right? Sometimes people don't maintain eye contact and they go inside and I'm fine with that because, I mean, I'm fine if they're not, but for other reasons, but I'm fine with it if, if they're deepening, okay? But sometimes there's an interruption and they're not, they may or may not be aware of it. It's like a catching of the breath or they stop the thought in that moment. And it's the implicit shame. It's like, we're not going there. Why not? Well, that's gonna say, it's gonna be proof that if I have that thought, feeling or memory, that's proof there's something wrong with me. They don't necessarily say that or even think that, but that's an example of how shame interrupts um, the aliveness in the moment. Yeah, so there's some really nice examples of potential, you know, markers or something that the client does and if, if you were to take one of those can like either the, the self-interruption or perhaps the you know breaking eye contact maybe looking down or shoulders rounding like how would you how might you work with a client if say this is happening in the moment well there are some things like with regard to looking down that you have to be careful about because <clears throat> eye contact for people, for people period, um, is very powerful and emotionally charged. And so they may end up having feelings, whether or not they're shame prone or not, that are, that are more than they can bear. Um, so if a person is looking down, uh, sometimes I, I won't ask them to look up. If I have an experience with them, like I know I have people who, uh, when they're dropping into shame and depression and feeling terrible about themselves, they literally drop and they look down. If I have 
experience with them where they trust me, I might say, can you look up? You don't have to look at me. Can you just sit up and look up? That can shift their experience. That can shift their experience from shutting down to open to something new, just through the movement. Uh, but other people, they can't tolerate that. So I might try to communicate, not just in my words, but in my tone that I'm with them. Because in shame, you feel utterly alone. You feel like you are banished from the universe of humanity, whether or not you're thinking that. So if I can communicate often non-verbally or in, like I said, uh, the, the prosody, the tone of my voice, or the word I use that captures something close to their experience, maybe even the very words that they use, then they're going to feel me with them. And that's going to hopefully begin to shift their experience of themselves as um, uh, worthless or something's wrong. Um, but, you know, the other things might be like the thing I just showed you where they're feeling some tension in their body and we kind of go with it and just see where the body wants to go, that will sometimes illuminate that they're experiencing feelings of shame or fear. Um, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm very direct, like uh, you can call it psychoeducational. They're describing something uh, related to feeling judged. And they'll use the word judged or use the word exposed. I hear the word judge or exposed, I'm almost always feeling shame. So, excuse me, I'm always thinking about shame. So then I might see if I can just help them. To, well, what are you, when you say they're judging you, what does that feel like? And sometimes they don't have words. Sometimes they say sad or I don't know, or I feel bad. Um, and then I will sometimes say that that's shame. And it's uh, often they had no idea I, when I was way back in my own therapy, I thought I was sad, but it wasn't sad. It was sad, hurt and shame, but I didn't know that I needed help from my therapist to recognize that shame. And once you have a way of holding it in your mind, it actually begins to become more manageable because there's this experience and then there's the observing of the experience. And now we have a word and it's called shame. And of course, shame means many, many things, but that begins to give the person ability to have some distance, um, not in a detached way, in a way that allows you to mindfully observe. And then you are less likely to feel shame about feeling shame. That's a very common experience that people are shamed of feeling shamed. And it's just like, shame on top of shame on top of shame, multiple layers. If you can observe it, then you become interested in shame and to be interested in something that is inherently shameful. That's one of those juxtapositions. You can't be interested in, in a state of shame at the same time, but you can, <laughs> that's that you work with that. Yeah, and I really hear that about the layers of shame and how shame about shame can really just double down on the, on the concealment, the, Yes. Availability. Yes. So some therapists, I suppose, and we're talking about coherence therapy here, and, uh, you know, we're talking about memory reconsolidation, that sometimes when a person is working with an experience in the present moment, it kind of unlocks perhaps a lot of deeper associated memories. Right. Right back. Would that be your experience that, you know, suddenly there's an availability of shaming moments or moments when a person was 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 unseen was unknown that sort of start becoming available to the person to be kind of explored do you do you, do you find that in your work yeah and um whether it's about shame or something else and um that's where you know the therapy comes alive both for the patient and the therapist and that's where discovery happens um and when you know, when you tap into something, it becomes like a well and it's sort of like a spare spring, you know, where things just sort of start developing and, um, and they start saying, or they're implicitly showing, oh, 
and then, and then, and then, and there's all this excitement happening and you're just sort of, now you've got a wave and you're just sort of like staying right there. And um, then, then you don't have as much to do. There's a lot of work that happens before, but when that starts opening up, then, you, then you're kind of staying out of their way or just being present. And they're kind of, they're in this process where they're discovering themselves in a way that they hadn't before. So yeah, that's, I mean, those are those quintessential moments as therapists were like, yay, <laughs> like it's happening, right? And they're often really unexpected. Uh, I, people will sometimes come back into therapy and they said, um, uh, that session really helped. And uh, they said, you know, when you said that thing, I'm like, uh, I don't remember what thing have I said? <laughs> And they said, when you said da-da-da, and I may remember it, or I may remember it and thinking it was nothing, or I may not even remember it. Um, and they say, yeah, or, or I've had experience in my own being in therapy where the therapist didn't say anything. I was just feeling really down. And they came out, you know, in the waiting room and they smiled at me. That was the whole session. That was the thing that made the difference. So then you pay attention to those things that help them connect with more of who they are or more of their own aliveness. Um, and if um, in, in, in certain approaches called narrative therapy, they're attending to the exceptions to the rule and the, if you will, the quote, positive exceptions to the rule. So these would be examples of noticing what and how uh, uh, things happen for them, either between me and the patient or between them and someone else that uh, brings them alive, that, that helps them discover something new about themselves. And then that we bring a lot of attention to that because that's both experientially going to bring something, but also helps them understand, oh, it's when I'm with that kind of person or that situation that I can be more myself. Yeah, so just in terms of, you know, those moments of self-discovery, of um, feeling alive, feeling known, feeling connected to you as a therapist, do you kind of notice a kind of a, there's a kind of a pattern to that with sort of clients getting more of that and that kind of building across sessions then that, is that something you've kind of observed then? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you can think about it. Uh, I sometimes think about it in terms of um, vertical and horizontal. So the vertical being uh, interrelational, how you're relating to your own experience and interrelational, how, how you're relating to me or me with you or others. So um, um, I'm sorry, can you say the question again so I can... Sure. Yeah. Just um, no. you're talking about, you know, sort of this, these experiences the client is having uh -huh. more aliveness, right. more connection. Yes. Do you yes. notice that, that across ses session? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, that what I just did with you now, that's a little embarrassing, right? I didn't remember exactly or could be potentially a little embarrassing. Um, um, if I can allow myself to be that. I wasn't planning on being embarrassed. <laughs> I was like, oh, I forgot what he's asking. But um, if you can allow that, then, um, then the person will feel they can be themselves as well. So again, it's not a technique. I'm not saying I'm gonna be this way so, so Vincent will feel more comfortable with me, but it sort of happens. But you know, if you think about sort of over time, um, what, what, you're, what you're hoping for over the time is that person not only discovers who they are, and dis but they discover who they are with themselves and in this case with you. Well, if you feel more and more that you can be you and that you, all of you, all those thoughts, feelings, and things that even the ones that you feel terrible about, all of you is welcome, back to the word welcome. All of you is welcome. Well, if, you, if that is your experience, then more and more you're coming into therapy and you feel welcomed by yourself and the other person. So they, you bring then much, much more to the therapy spontaneously. It's not like you're planning. 
Um, and if that gets interrupted where they're really feeling a flow and then they suddenly in the moment get stopped, well, that's really useful. That's not bad. That tells you, oh, isn't that interesting? We're, we're going along here and then you went blank or we're going along here and um, you felt yourself tightening up and you didn't know why. So then it becomes possible to explore that because you have a whole foundation in the relationship to themselves and with you that says, welcome, like, yeah, sure. There's no problem here. You tightened up or you felt that what you said was boring. Great. <laughs> Not great. Like I'm happy you're bored uh, about yourself, but more let, let's see what that's telling us. And if, um, if, if I have clients who sort of tease me, you know, I use certain words like I invite or um, be, let's be curious, you know, these kind of like therapy lingo, but, you know, so they tease me about it because they know I'm kind of sounding like a therapist, but, but they're also using that. They're using that themselves. So then, oh, well, okay, I'll be curious about that. And they kind of wink at me. Like, I, I know you've told me that word, Ken, but, but they are. And curious means, I don't know, but I'm interested. Yeah, it becomes like a kind of a private joke, which has got its own kind of, right. um, yeah, charm, right. I guess. Uh, right, right. Yeah, they, they have their inner Ken Ben out of this. Oh, okay, this is a, I, I, I heard you say, be curious when I was da 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 da. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was interesting what happened a moment ago when um, you asked me to repeat the question. And then it's like something happened for you then as an experience where it, it looked to me, and you can, I'll check it out with you. You can tell me, you know, what actually happened. But it looked to me like you, you noticed that that could have been embarrassing, something about that. And you checked it out with yourself. And then you were able to share that with me. Is that kind of something like what happened? And would that be something that would happen perhaps with a client even? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, sensitive to shame. I mean, people who are really interested in shame, they didn't come to it intellectually. <laughs> they have to have lived it and been troubled by it. And, okay, so so I wasn't like thinking I was embarrassed. I was feeling, oh, because I know me, I'll get, I'm very free associative, so I can go on and I forgot where I started or, where, you know, I knew you, but I, so in that moment, I actually lost, I literally lost track of what you said. And so I'm thinking, okay, okay, what did he say? Can I get back there? And I was like, I couldn't get there. I knew it was important because you were talking about this sort of over time and over cross sessions, which I thought was a really good question. So I knew it was important. I was like, I don't know where I just went. So I did feel a little embarrassed. Uh, so I could have faked it. That would have been an example of shame kind of winning the day, right? Because I'm kind of covering and acting like, oh yeah, so I'll just say something and maybe it's related to the question. So I, I checked myself. That was an interruption, a pause. But in, for, in my case, it was a little whiff of shame. And so... Um, because I feel comfortable with you and I feel comfortable with myself with you. Um, so even though we don't have much history, we have this history, right? And you're listening and you're taking interest and, oh, that makes me think of. So you're having your association. So we have a kind of co relational context. We didn't plan it. You and I have never met before, but here's, this is happening. And so I'm having this moment where should I, or should I not say to Vincent, I have no idea what he just asked me. So I decided to say it to you, but because we're talking about shame, I, I described a little bit about my process now I, uh, with you. Um, but I, I may or may not do that with a patient, but I may. Like, um, and it could be quite useful. Like um, I'm having a hard time tracking right now, or um, this is a hard one to say because people could think you're not interested in them, but you're saying, I'm getting a little sleepy. Uh, are you noticing that? Or is there something, I kind of feel like there's something we're not talking about and I, I don't know what it is because something's, I feel something kind of deadening in the session. So I will, or I'll say, I get that tingling sensation and I, I get that when I feel like we're onto something. So I will share these things with people, not every moment of every thought or feeling I have, but yeah, I will share it. Um, for lots of reasons. But the main one, I guess, is because it's happening. It's telling us something about me, them, or us. Um, it brings something spontaneous and alive in the moment, which invites them, back to the invite word, invites them to do the same. So, and I've been around 
long enough to tr what they call trust the process. That's kind of a classic therapy lingo. But I do trust the process, especially with certain people where we've developed a kind of rapport. I don't know where things are going, but I trust that if I listen to my experience and theirs, something good will come of it. So that's why I didn't plan to tell you about feeling embarrassed, but look what it's led, to, led us to. Um, yeah, this is lovely. It's a really rich um, territory because it's told me a lot and I've experienced a lot. I've noticed even myself becoming a little bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I was pretty relaxed already, but mm -hmm. that, you know, that was, there was a lot of trust there that you were able mm -hmm. to, you know, slow down, you know, notice that, oh, this is, feels a little bit embarrassing. It even wasn't even a thought. It was an experiential shift. Yeah. But it sounded to me, Ken, like it was a supportive interruption rather than a, okay, I got to hide this kind of interruption. And I wonder, is that kind of how you experience it? Or am I right, right about that? Supportive meaning that it's something that could be helpful or useful in, in our conversation or our experience together. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, I'm embarrassed. So in that moment, even if it's just a little whiff, so it, it doesn't in the moment feel like, oh, this will be a good thing. I'll just sort of feel this and share this and we'll be off and running. No, I'm actually feeling some embarrassment. But, um, but at the same time, I guess you could think of it, this as trained spontaneity. Um, uh, I've learned, it's not 100%, but I've learned to trust myself. Like I, I, I know myself, I don't know everything, but I've done the work a long time. I've been in my own therapy a long time. It's not like I don't discover something new. I hopefully do about myself, but I trust myself and I trust my capacity to do the work because I have and, uh, uh, and, and I've been helpful because the person I'm working with lets me know I've been helpful. So um, I trust that if I'm experiencing something um, that for some people at some moments, it will be helpful to share not always, but I trust that if I do, something good will happen. So in that moment, I was feeling embarrassed. In that moment, I was thinking, I don't know if I wanna say this. So in that moment, there was shame telling me, keep it hidden, keep it hidden, keep it hidden. But back to train spontaneity, another part of me said, I'm just gonna say it. And um, it opened it up, not just for me, but for you. And by the way, when you said you were feeling more relaxed, I, I, I know I was any, if, if, if you were my patient, I'd say, uh, what do you notice that tells you relaxed? Or what is it that we're doing here that, um, helps you feel more relaxed or literally when you said it, your face softened, mm. um, but maybe it was already softened and I didn't notice it. But then when you said it, I saw this softening in your face. So I knew you weren't just saying it. Um, and I may or may not have said to you, like I just did now, oh yeah, there was this lovely softening in your face as you said that. And now I just shared that with you. I, what, what was that? I mean, I don't know, you don't have to tell me, but what was it like for me to tell you I saw this softening? I, I, it's funny because I was thinking the same thing. Um, oh, you you yeah. felt your own softening? I, well, I, it's funny because Zoom is kind of strange, isn't it? Because we've got this kind right. of mirror. And actually, I've noticed even in my own face, look softer even to me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so I, how is it? Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. No, you, you go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, um, it feels good, of course. And I think it is to do with the, the, the trust that you have in me already that, you know, I can tell Vincent, you know, can you repeat the question? And then I can tell right. him, yeah, that I felt a little bit embarrassed and I, right. you know, I kind of right. check that out. So that, that feed for me feels really lovely, actually, because, right. you know, it feels because, you know, Ken doesn't know me very well, but he already trusts me enough to tell me these things. So right. it just feels good, doesn't it? And yes. yeah. that connection yeah. feels good. And yeah. 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 And then um, it, and it allows us not just to talk about it now, but in ways that neither you or I could really name, it's going to allow for some possibilities in whatever we do in the rest of our time together that wouldn't have been there because we both now have said, oh, yeah. I like Vincent and I like Ken and we feel comfortable with each other and wow, this is cool. Let's see where it's going to take us. And then, so that 
um, in ADP, they talk about it as meta processing or meta therapeutic processing. So there's a, a moment that feels good or different, and you bring some attention to that, and then it kind of has this sort of exponential effect and ripple effect in ways that you can't predict, but you know, yeah, something good's going to continue to happen here because uh, Vincent and I just said we enjoyed being with each other. Yeah, definitely. And that's all, that's all an experience before it's even a thought. Like right. I'm, I'm narrating. I'm pretty good at narrating experience at this point, but um, I didn't have to narrate that for us to have the benefits of it. And some people would say, don't narrate it. Just, just see where it takes you. But I'm, I'm narrating in part because this is uh, intended as a learning experience for whomever chooses to view this. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, we could just sit here in silence for an hour and a half and enjoy that, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Right. I, just so you know, I'm aware of time. And yes. so if we, if, if we go a few more minutes, that would be okay. But just yeah, abs letting... absolutely can. Yeah. And uh, thanks for saying that because I kind of, I kind of lost track of time and I wasn't, uh, I could I, I could do this um, for ages, but we, we do need to. Well, that's a good, but that's a good example, right? Um, if you're with someone and engaged, it's does it, time is is irrelevant. So the fact that I did I I was shocked to see it was as late. I mean that we've been going you know almost two hours. Mm. I would have had no idea. Yeah, and that too. happens right. And it happens sometimes. I'm with a client and then I'm like looking up like oh my god it's uh, it's running really late. I'm like that that's a good session. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't, that you don't notice the time so yeah. I guess this has been good for both of us yeah definitely definitely so I'm just going to have a quick look if there's one one last question um yeah maybe this one Ken just uh do you know thinking about colleagues you know fellow therapists who are watching this what might what message might you have for them around you know the the the, the value or the richness of working more experientially with with their clients um, no pun intended, the best way you'll know that working experientially um, brings something to the work that you that was helpful and beneficial to you to know is to have the experience. So um, whether it's in your training or your own therapy, um, if you can work with someone who works paying attention to emotion or works with the body or kind of quote bottom-up processing or noticing something in the moment um, or just paying attention without always knowing what it means, then you will feel what it feels like. And I think the best way to learn how to be a therapist is to be in therapy and as well as trainings where the trainings are more experiential. So um, I always say to people I train, if it doesn't feel like you don't do it, if talking about whatever feels more you than paying attention to the body, like you've, you've checked, you've attended the trainings in the body. You're like, that's not me. Don't do it because I, it's most important that you show up, not uh, because I told you body therapy is good. But I remember my first training and in, in the sensory motor psychotherapy, I was like, Oh my God, I had no idea that little something that I felt in my body was like an open up uh, awareness that I never had. I had no idea. So you have the, those experiences. You want to learn more and you want to see if you can um, uh, help facilitate a similar experience with your patients. So the first thing is check it out. And they say, well, what to check out? I don't know. Go look. I mean, I can tell you what I've done. I'll tell you a little about it. But I usually say, uh, follow your curiosity because curiosity and interest is where you're alive. It's where you're beginning to connect with something, even though you have no idea why you connect with it. It's the same with like, you know, they say, well, how do you know the therapist is good? Well, you should know uh, within the first 15 minutes, like you may or may not, because you may have been so nervous, but quickly you'll see like, oh, the time flew and it was easy to talk with him or her. So that's experiential. So I would say, um, do it, experience it, and then play with it, right? And, and be comfortable 
with being uncomfortable. In other words, you, in the beginning, you're going to feel like, uh, what did I, how am I supposed to do this? Uh, hang in there with it because if it, if it feels, um, it can become more you. It's like learning to ride a bike. Initially, you're like left foot, right foot. Uh, and then afterwards, you're riding a bike. So if you can hang in with it and tolerate the discomfort, you may come to discover that it, it, it uh, yields something in the work that is surprising. Um, and then you'll know you want more of that. Okay, that's, that's going to be, I think, a wrap, Ken. So I um, just want to just finish by saying thank you so much, um, Ken Banau, PhD, um, for coming here today and talking with me and sharing your, your very rich experience. And I have to say, it's been a, a delight uh, for me. And so um, I just might mention your book as well. So it's Shame, Pride and Relational Trauma, Concepts and Psychotherapy coming out. Um, I'm, I'm sure it'll be excellent. And I'm looking forward to reading it. So thank you again, Ken. Well, th thank you. I mean, this is obviously something that, that you and I co-created, right? We didn't plan it, but we, it happened. So uh, there's no way this experience would be enjoyable for you if it wasn't for me. So thank you as well.